In Edinburgh Castle sit the Scottish Crown Jewels, a collection of items whose history has been one wild ride. They've been hidden in Donotter Castle, then smuggled out and stashed under a church floor to protect them from Oliver Cromwell. Lost for over a century, then dramatically rediscovered by a famous Scottish writer and hidden from the Nazis when it was feared the United Kingdom might fall during World War II. They're also the oldest crown jewels in Britain, and in between their other adventures, they've been used in the coronations of famous monarchs, including the infant Mary Queen of Scots and the deposed and exiled Charles II. This is History Calling, where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past, and today we're heading to Scotland. Please remember to give this video a thumbs up, and for more incredible historical stories, hit the subscribe button and switch on notifications so you never miss one of my uploads. If you check out the description box below, you'll also find a link to my Instagram there. The Scottish Crown Jewels, also known as the Honours of Scotland or the Scottish Regalia, consist of the Crown of Scotland, the Scepter and the Sword of State. The Scepter is the oldest. It's made from silver gilt and is traditionally said to have been given to the Scottish monarch James IV in 1494 by Pope Alexander VI. Scotland, of course, was still Catholic at that point. It's hexagonal in form and was altered and lengthened in 1536. The stem is decorated with the engraved ornamentations you see here, which depict fleur-de-lis and thistles, thistles being a famous symbol associated with Scotland. Towards the top of this stem are figures of the Virgin and Child, St. James and St. Andrew, as well as dolphins, which represent the church and which you can see on the far left on either side of Mary and Jesus. Near its top is a globe of rock crystal, about the size of a tomato, and which is surmounted by a smaller golden globe with a pearl on it. The scepter is about 34 inches long. According to a description of the honours on the royal family's website, the Sword of State was created by Domenico de Sutri and given to James IV in 1507 by Pope Julius II. It is nearly 1.4 metres or 5 feet long and boasts a silver gilt handle, quote, decorated with oak leaves and acorns, because these symbolise Christ after he rose from the dead. The website continues that, at the bottom of the handle are two stylized oak leaves overlapping the blade. The cross of the sword is in the form of two dolphins, their tails ending in acorns, and the blade is etched with figures of St. Paul and St. Peter and the words Julius II Pont Max, meaning Julius II Supreme Pontiff, all of which you can see in this old drawing. The sword has a break in it, but you'll have to wait another few minutes to hear the supposed reason why. It came with a scabbard you see here, described as a scabbard of wood covered in dark red velvet and mounted with silver gilt. It too has its own decorations, which you can get a better feel for in these close-ups. There was also a belt of woven silk and gold thread decorated with the arms of Pope Julius. This belt has endured its own little mystery, separate from the rest of the regalia, but again, you'll have to keep watching to find out what it is. The crown is, I think, the most spectacular item. It weighs in at 1.64 kilograms and in its current form dates to 1540 when James V had the Scottish goldsmith James Mossman fashion it from a pre-existing but damaged crown already in the king's possession. The monarch then wore it to the coronation of his wife Mary of Guise here in the Abbey Church at Holyrood Palace. The gold used comes from Scotland and according to the royal family's website again, the circlet is encrusted with 22 gemstones and 20 precious stones, taken from the previous crown. These jewels include topazes, amethysts, emeralds and rubies. It is further augmented with Scottish freshwater pearls. The lack of faceting on the gemstones present, which is tricky to see in images but take my word for it, they are quite rough cut, has suggested to some that they date to the 14th century, before the faceting of jewels became more common. This is merely the bottom band of the crown, however. Writing in 1829, William Bell gave a detailed description of the rest of it, saying, Above the said circle is another small one, formed with 20 points, and set with the like number of diamonds and sapphires alternately, and on each point is a large pearl. Thirdly, the upper circle is raised with 10 crosses florae, 
each of which is adorned in the centre with a diamond, between four pearls in cross, some of which are wanting, and the number remaining on the upper part of the crown, with what are in the under circle and in the cross pate, are fifty-one, and those crosses flore are interchanged with ten high fleur-de-lis, alternately, between the great pearls, on the points of the second circle. So far what has been described would seem to be the original, much older crown, but Bell went on to explain that it is closed at the top with four arches, decorated with enamel figures and topped with, quote, a celestial globe of gold enameled with blue. Above this is a golden cross decorated with pearls and a large amethyst in its centre, and the letters JRV at its base, indicating that James V was the one who had the arches, globe and cross added. This fits with the date of construction for the present crown of 1540. To make it more comfortable to wear, it includes a fur-trimmed velvet bonnet, originally purple but now crimson, which is decorated with four plates of gold onto which large pearls are set. We've already heard that the crown was worn at the coronation of Mary of Guise in 1540, but the complete set of jewels were used just three years later to crown her infant daughter, Mary Queen of Scots, who inherited the throne at just six days old and was crowned in 1543 at Stirling Castle at the age of nine months. Apparently she cried throughout the ceremony, not a good omen given how her life and reign would turn out. To learn more, see my videos, which I'll leave linked below for you, on her rivalry with Elizabeth I of England and her death. The honours would be used again in 1567 to crown this queen's one-year-old son, James VI, after his mother was forced to abdicate in his favour. Finally, in 1633, they were used in an adult coronation, that of Charles I, who'd actually become king back in 1625 but hadn't got around to being crowned in Scotland until eight years later. Their final use in a coronation service was much more dramatic. During the 1640s, civil war raged throughout England, the upshot of which was that Charles I was deposed and executed in January 1649, and the monarchy was replaced by a protectorate under the control of Oliver Cromwell. Charles's eldest son, another Charles, was living in exile in mainland Europe and trying to muster enough support to retake the crown. In 1650, he came to Scotland, where he was crowned with a regalia on New Year's Day 1651 in Scone. After a failed invasion of England, Charles II escaped back to France in the autumn of 1651, just a few months after the honours of Scotland had embarked on their first big adventure. Back in England, Cromwell was breaking up and either selling or destroying the English crown jewels, as he sought to eradicate these symbols of monarchy. He would surely have done the same to their Scottish counterparts given the chance, and so the decision was taken to hide the jewels. On the 6th of June, 1651, the Scottish Parliament ordered that Instrumentus taken be the Earl Marshal upon the production of the honours, with his desire represented to the Parliament that the same might be put in some part of security. His Majesty and Parliament ordains the said Earl Marshal to cause and transport the said honours to the House of Donotter, there to be kept by him till further orders. The house of Donotter, where the jewels were to be taken, was Donotter Castle, located in the northeast of Scotland and home to the Earl's Marshal you've just heard mentioned. At the time, the incumbent Earl was William Keith, 6th Earl Marshal. The jewels were apparently conveyed to the castle inside a large sack of wool carried by a Mrs. Catherine Drummond, but despite the dangers she undertook in getting them there, she never received any reward for her efforts, and they didn't even remain safe in their new home for long. The Earl was frequently away, fighting for King Charles II, and he appointed a lieutenant governor to care for his castle in his absence, named George Ogilvy. Then, in August 1651, the Earl was captured by Cromwellian forces at Aleth and taken to London as a prisoner. Worried about the safety of the regalia in his castle, he managed to send a message to his mother, the Dowager Countess, along with the key to the strong room in Donotter where the jewels were held, and told her to give them to Ogilvy to protect. The Countess did so, and then withdrew to her house at Panmure. Soon after, despite orders from the Scottish Government, known as the Committee of Estates, to Ogilvy, telling him to hand the regalia over to the Laird of Innes so that they could be spirited away further into the Highlands, Ogilvy held on to them, basically claiming that he didn't have the correct paperwork to relinquish them. 
By November, Dunodder was besieged by Cromwellian troops, and when it became clear that no help was coming to relieve its inhabitants, a plan was hatched to smuggle the honours of Scotland out. As sieges go, that at Dunodder wasn't especially harsh. Non-combatants were still allowed in and out of the castle, and it was possible to escape it by sea. In this way, Earl Marshall's younger brother, the teenage John Keith, managed to get out in December 1650 and sail to mainland Europe. This fairly lax siege is also the reason it was possible to get the regalia out. In early 1652, Ogilvy's wife Elizabeth, who was holed up in the castle with him, asked Mrs Christian Granger, whose husband James was the minister of nearby Caneff, to assist in removing the regalia from the castle. It was later claimed that the Dowager Countess Marshall had been the brains behind this plan, but whether there is any truth in that story remains unclear. According to a statement made in 1664 by Christian Granger, in February of 1652 she received the crown and sceptre from Elizabeth and managed to get them out of the castle. Some sources say she had them wrapped up in her skirts, but the lady herself didn't specify how she removed them. She then rode home along the cliff tops with them, determined to throw them into the sea should she be approached by the English. Fortunately, she made it back to her house safely, and that night she and her husband, the Reverend James, wrapped them in clothes and buried them under the floor of Caneff Church. The following month, she went back for the sword. This time, she took an unnamed servant girl with her, and they wrapped up the last piece of the regalia in what she called hards, meaning flax, and walked out of the castle with it past the English troops. You'll remember I told you that the sword today has a mended break in it. Tradition has it that this originated in 1652 when the blade had to be snapped in two so that the otherwise very long sword could be smuggled out of Donauder undetected. I can't tell you, unfortunately, if that story is true, however. Soon after rescuing the sword, Christian went back for the scabbard, which she smuggled out wrapped up in cods, meaning pillows. Both items joined the crown and scepter under the church floor, and over the next eight years, Christian and James Granger would dig them up every three months and air them in front of the fire before reburying them. Her description of how the regalia were hidden is borne out by a statement given by her husband to the Dowager Countess Marshall in March 1652, which gives some additional details as to how they were concealed. It reads, I, Mr. James Granger, Minister at Caneff, grant me to have in my custody the honours of the kingdom, viz. the crown, sceptre and sword. For the crown and sceptre, I raised the pavement stone just before the pulpit in the night time and digged under it one hole and put them in there and filled up the hole and laid down the stone just as it was before and removed the mould that remained that none would have discerned the stone to have been raised at all. The sword again at the west end of the church, among some common seats that stand there. I digged down in the ground betwixt the two foremost of these seats, and laid it down within the case of it, and covered it up, as that removing the superfluous mould it could not be discerned by anybody. For if it shall please God to call me by death before they be called for, your ladyship will find them in that place. The concealment of the regalia in the church is therefore not in dispute. But Christian Granger's account of how they were removed from Donauder Castle, and how important her role in the operation was, is. For there is another account, this time written by William Meston, who was the tutor to the Marshall family at the start of the 18th century. He claimed that Elizabeth Ogilvy arranged to have Christian Granger send an unnamed servant girl, quote, to the side of the rock on which the castle stood towards the sea, on pretense of gathering dulse and tangles, that seaweed and by coming frequently and rendering herself familiar to Cromwell's soldiers, all suspicion of her would be removed. This had the desired effect, and the regalia were safely transported from the castle through the enemy's camp under dulse and coverings, and committed to the care of Mrs Granger, who, with the assistance of Mr Ogilvy, factor to Earl Marshall, the only person to whom she communicated the secret, dug a hole under the pulpit of the Church of Caneff and there buried them, where they remained till the restoration. In some secondary accounts of the history of the regalia which I've read, this story of how they were conveyed out of the castle and concealed is preferred to that given by Christian Granger in 1664. However, I personally favour her story. The account I've just read you dates to much later, doesn't come from someone who was personally involved in the events it describes, 
and includes some demonstrable errors. For instance, earlier in the account, Meston states that George Ogilvy entrusted the job of removing the regalia to his wife Elizabeth, as he didn't wish to know how they were being removed or where they would be taken, so that he couldn't be made to reveal their location if he was captured by the English. Yet in the segment I read to you, Meston states that Christian Granger told Ogilvy where the regalia were hidden, which would have defeated the whole purpose of this precaution. Meston also states that the Dowager Countess Marshall knew nothing about the fate of the regalia until after they were recovered in 1660. But as we've seen, James Granger sent her a letter back in March 1652 explaining exactly where they were hidden. There's really no reason to doubt the story given by Christian Granger. Though she may have exaggerated the drama of events slightly, everything she said is supported by the other contemporary sources available. We aren't sure, by the way, exactly what George Ogilvy genuinely knew and when. Donotter Castle eventually fell to the English on the 24th of May 1652, and they were not happy when they realised the honours of Scotland were no longer there. The Ogilvies were imprisoned in the castle until January 1653, and to help throw the Cromwellians off the scent, the Dowager Countess Marshall put out the story that her younger son, John Keith, the one who escaped the castle by boat in December 1650, had taken them with him to mainland Europe. Keith repeated this story too, even going so far as to have fake documentation drawn up which appeared to show he had offloaded the jewels in France, and this explanation was accepted by the English, who eventually ceased looking for them. In 1660, Charles II was restored to the throne, and it was time for the regalia to be restored to him. A very unseemly row now broke out between the Grangers, the Ogilvies, and the Marshall family as to who deserved credit for the salvation of the honours, and a tug of war ensued as each side tried to keep or acquire these precious items. By September, George Ogilvy had acquired the scepter from the Grangers, and in October, both he and the Reverend James Granger went to Donotter Castle and handed over the various items they possessed to Earl Marshall, though only Ogilvy was given a receipt for them, leading Granger to issue a declaration 12 days later stating that he had held the regalia since 1652, no matter what Ogilvy pretended. Curiously, the sword's belt wasn't returned with the rest of the regalia. Instead, rather bizarrely, it was found in about 1790, buried within a garden wall on land belonging to the Ogilvy family. It stayed in their custody until 1892, when it was returned to Edinburgh Castle. Theories I've read about this suggest that it was buried under the church floor in 1652, but was held back by Ogilvy when the honours were being returned in 1660. I'm not convinced, though, that it was ever in Kenef Church. James Granger didn't mention it in his letter to Countess Marshall, explaining the location of the honours, and it was he who returned the sword to the Marshalls in 1660, not Ogilvy. Surely, had he had the belt, he would have returned it at that point too, or raised a stink if he knew Ogilvy had it and wasn't giving it back. I wonder instead if Ogilvy had kept it the whole time, from the moment he took custody of the regalia in 1651, and if Granger was unaware of the belt's existence. The whole situation regarding who had saved the regalia was a mess, and in the end, the Scottish and English parliaments and the King gave varying degrees of credit and rewards to nearly all involved. Though the Marshall family really had nothing to do with the regalia's removal from Donotter Castle and its safekeeping, the Dowager Countess did her utmost in letters to the King to make it appear that she and her family had been instrumental in the jewel's survival. The result was that her younger son, John Keith, was made a Knight Marshal in 1660 for, quote, the great service he performed in the entire preserving of His Majesty's royal honours. He later became Earl of Kintore. George Ogilvy was made a Baronet in 1662 and granted lands. Christian Granger was granted the sum of 2,000 marks by the Scottish Parliament in 1661, but little or none of it was ever paid and the unnamed servant girl, whose efforts were apparently second only to Christian's, got nothing as far as we can tell, not even her name in the records. The regalia were now returned to Edinburgh Castle, and continued to be used to represent the absent monarch at meetings of the Scottish Parliament. In 1707, however, the Act of Union between Scotland and England slash Wales eradicated that Parliament, and the regalia no longer had any purpose. 
On the 26th of March of that year, after a ceremony in Edinburgh Castle, they were locked inside a large wooden chest secured with two huge padlocks. They were then left in a small upstairs room known as the Crown Room, which is still accessible today through the door you see in this picture. Once there, they were more or less forgotten about. More than a century went by, and rumours spread that the honours had been taken to England. The room they had been placed in was actually opened up on the 5th of November 1794 during a search for some state records, but the chest was left undisturbed, as those present didn't feel they were empowered to break it open. Then, in 1817, came the next twist in the story of these crown jewels. In that year, the Prince Regent, the future George IV, decided to put an end to the mystery of what had happened to the honours, and on the 28th of October he issued a warrant to have the Crown Room in Edinburgh Castle and its mysterious chest opened up and the jewels recovered. This was done on the 4th of February 1818 by a group of men which included the famous Scottish writer Walter Scott, acting in his capacity as a clerk of the session. The keys to the chest had long since been lost, but according to a report published on the 10th of February in the Times newspaper, the commissioners, according to the tenor of their warrant, directed the chest to be forced open, which was effected with some difficulty. It was found to contain the crown, scepter and sword of state of Scotland. Along with them was a silver mace, which, it was eventually decided, was the mace of office of the Scottish Lord High Treasurer. According to the report made to the Prince Regent by those who had found the regalia, the items were in remarkably good condition, and still wrapped in the linen in which they had initially been deposited. Of the crown, they wrote, The velvet and ermine are not materially injured, and the pearls are less tarnished in their lustre than was to have been apprehended. The sword wasn't in the best shape, as, quote, both the pommel and the ornamented scabbard appear to have sustained considerable injury prior to their depositation, but the blade has been very little affected with rust. As for the scepter, it was, quote, a little bent where the crystal globe rises from the capital, an injury which it appears to us to have received prior to its depositation in 1707. We might wonder, in fact, if such damage as there was had happened while the items were being smuggled out of Donotter 166 years earlier, or when they were repeatedly buried and disinterred from the floor of Kenef Church during the 1650s. In 1819, the regalia and the silver mace found with them were put on public display in the very crown room where they had already remained for so many years. It seemed like their adventures were done and dusted. But when World War II broke out, there were fresh fears for their safety in case the United Kingdom should fall and the regalia might be seized by the Nazis. To ward off this possibility, in 1941 they were buried again, this time in various locations around Edinburgh Castle. When the war was over, they were returned to their display case in the castle, where they can still be seen, though not photographed, today. They are generally only removed for occasional state events, which is where this photo of the crown comes from. Over the years, some additional items gifted or returned to the Scottish people have been added to the display. These include jewels given by Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyll, and perhaps most importantly, the ancient Stone of Schoon, aka the Stone of Destiny. This was used in the coronation of Scottish monarchs, then taken by the English in 1296 and incorporated into their own coronation ceremonies. You can see it here beneath the coronation chair in this image. This was returned to Scotland 700 years later in 1996 and is apparently going to be moved to Perth in 2024. Who knows if the escapades of the Scottish Crown Jewels are finally over or not, but for now, if you find yourself in Edinburgh with a few hours to spare, you might enjoy a visit to the castle to see them. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite part of their story is, and if you like tales about fantastic treasures, try one of these videos next. Whatever you select, please enjoy, and until next time, keep learning.